Uh, so good afternoon. Welcome to CyclopsCon DCC College. Uh, this time around, it seems we have a tournament heavy panel of judges with us. Uh, going alphabetically, uh, we have Michael Bolum. Mike has been regularly running DCC and MCC games since the road cruise kicked off in 2013. He is a regular playtester for Goodman Games and third party projects like Starcrawl and has been a judge and writer for the DCC Open Tournament at Gen Con. Uh, next, we have Tim Deshane. Go ahead and wave, guys. Be, be personable. <laughs> Uh, he, he's another longtime road crew play tester and tournament judge and contributor with us. Uh, Tim, our Northern David Beatty, is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, just successfully kickstarted the One of Us zine for DCC. Haley Sketch has been playing DCC for quite literally half her life. She started judging five years ago, leaving her brother in the dust and ran a full tournament single-handedly, showing the rest of us just how old we are. <clears throat> uh, over in our next panel, we have Evie Walls. She's been playing DCC since she was eight. In 2017, she judged her first Gen Con event at the age of 11. And she's a favorite at DougCon as she embraces the weird at a level only Doug Kovacs can predict. My turn. And with her, we have James Walls. Uh, you may know James as the Phlogiston Infected Wizard from Gen Con. He's been playing and judging DCC since 2014, literally taking the road crew and Evie to the road, road and to various and conventions. Evie to the road, and, and he and Evie both host a weekly Twitch live stream on Sunday nights called Living for Crits. So that is our awesome panel. Um, and I already have a question in, in the sidebar here. Will the recording be made available to attendees? Um, possibly, you'd have to check with the Goodman Games crew on that. Uh, now, over the past week, a lot of you have signed up to attend this uh, little private meeting in Zoom before it goes out to Twitch. Uh, surprise, it's all happening at once. But we did get a lot of uh, questions submitted from you guys earlier. Uh, we have so many that they've been kind of grouped together in sections by, uh, by genre, if you will. And I think the best way to handle this is, you know, how else do we do it in DCC? We roll off for it. So I've got a D8 here. And that brings us to category three. Uh, oh, with our awesome original adventures reincarnated line many of the dcc faithful are picking these up and reading them and finding themselves wondering how to convert them to dcc so let's open the panel open this up to our panel um mike uh what are there any resources you would recommend for converting adventures to dcc uh, any practices or approaches you can offer yeah, um, this is a, a very common question from all different uh, versions of typically old Dungeons and Dragons adventures. Right. Uh, my, my number one recommendation is to just do it on the fly. Um, <laughs> if you've got a little bit of practice with DCC um, and use the 5e stats, they've put a ton of work into the 5e stats. So for hit dice and the armor class, it's already set up and just like what else do you need to know you can ignore half the attacks that things can do you can ignore the stat damage or all, like the giant stat block um and uh i would also suggest like <sighs> describing the monsters not telling the players what the monsters are um you know oh, it's not getting you're not fighting a pack of kobolds. It's little <laughs> snarly pointy teeth things um, that bark at you or something. So it's you, it's the kobolds, you know, it's the goblin stats, but um, the players don't know that. They can make up their own name. Um, the players don't know that. They can make up their own name. Nice. Uh, rest of the panel, weigh in as you see fit. 
I, I agree with Mike funny. mostly because I'm uh, I'm lazy. So mm -hmm. doing it on the fly is, so is definitely on the fly uh, up my alley. For me, the old adventure is the most important part. Really, is just having the map. So I don't really need like if I if I know the location, um, I can pick monsters out of the DCC book and just use those stats. Or like as long as you have the AC and hit die is pretty much you know like Mike said, it's the most important part. And then giving them special attacks. You know if they don't already have them trying to make them a little bit less generic um but yeah i think if you're going from anything to dcc and you're playing dcc the people playing it aren't going to care if you do it 100 percent, you know balance math and all that stuff it's it's harder to go the other way probably but that also daniel bishop on his blog has i guess some some tips and tricks which if you're if you're really worried about the numbers i would go there uh, Raven croaking, I think, blog spot. So. Oh, yeah, good, good call. Um, James, I know you've been playing forever. Anything to add to that one? Well, the only thing I would add is that, uh, and I would, I would, uh, I would concur with with Mike and with him, and and say you could you could convert it, uh, just use the fifth edition stats, or you could use the original uh, module stats. I've I've run quite a few. Uh, you know, basic D and D adventures from the late '80s or early '90s with quick conversions. Same thing. You know, just you know, you, whatever the whatever under nine the armor class is, just add it to ten, and you can go the opposite direction. Use you know, hit dice as base attack stuff like that. I we really don't play five A, so I don't. You know, I would I would rather look at the at the at the older stats and convert from there. But the cool thing with those books is you have both to choose from. So. You can go in any direction you'd like to convert from, but converting on the fly is definitely the way to go. All right. Um, my next roll was a six, which brings us to new players, which is probably one of the hottest topics that was mailed to us. Uh, so let me start. Uh, Haley, we have weird dice in DCC. Do you have any tips on getting new players past that? that stigma against the weird dice? I mean, personally, I think the weird dice are one of the things that attracts people to DCC um, because it's something different. It's something that stands out. Um, but I think starting with dice that are like, don't start them off with a D7 because they're never going to accept that. You've <laughs> got to start them off with something that's really similar, like a, like a D16 or something like that and use them in ways that are good, bump them up to a d24. If you start bringing them down, they're going to get like negative connotations of the dice. That's pretty cool. Um, Evie, what what would you say um, on on tips to make a good experience with DCC for first time gamers? Um, Have you had to convert new players and and get them to play DCC? Um, so basically what I do is kind of go like insane because you want to like get them hooked, you know? So like you got to go like insane on the first run because if it's like if you run something that's like just like based off of the books, they're not going to be like, oh, that was spectacular. Like you want to like just go kind of like berserk, you know, it's kind of what DCC is in a way. So you want to just go like crazy and then they'll like want to come back for more. And that's you got to like get them hooked on like the first time playing. Um, Tim, do you think DCC is a good system to introduce new players without previous RPG experience into the hobby with? Actually, yeah, I think I prefer to introduce it to new players that don't have, I think it's easier for new players that don't have uh, expectations of what, you know, a fantasy role-playing game is supposed to play like, or especially they come from really heavily um, thought out rule systems. Um, sometimes they look at it and they're like, I'm supposed to roll 3d6 for, you know, attributes and that sets you know, that kind of turns them off. But if they're a brand new player, they don't have that, that prejudice already. You get them in and it's just like, yeah, this is your character. And, uh, I think if you set off new players with, you know, letting them try the things they asked for that aren't covered in rule system, which is why DCC is beautiful, but they want to do something that's not spelled out and you'll be able to, you know, adjudicate that as the judge. It's awesome because they're like, oh, cool. I can do anything I want. This is like, I am, you know, a character in a story or. Um, 
and then the funnel also gets them over their first character death pain as well you know it's like we're gonna have fun with this massacring all your you know uh, all your villagers yes so, so, so for sure i would much I, like i said i prefer doing it with new players and do the rest of you have a, a strong opinion on this one yeah i mean i think we're all gonna probably agree <laughs> um i would say the um the zero level um version of dcc is probably one of the simplest rpgs that's out there um from a new player perspective, uh, even you know, I, I my other go to is like BX, and sure, that's super easy, and I can teach anyone BX. But then all of a sudden, it's like, wait, am I trying to roll high or low right now? What's my wait? I have to have percentile dice. What's that mean? Um, and uh, wh why is an armor class of zero better than an armor class of eight? Um, and so, the DCC, you're always trying to roll high, unless you're trying to roll under your luck, right? So that's all you need to do. Roll the die, roll that circular one, and, and it doesn't have to use the funky dice in that first step. It's just the seven kind of core dice, and you can really get away with just putting a d20 and whatever their hit die is and whatever their weapon damage die is in front of them, and they're done. Um, that's all they're going to need most of the time for that zero level adventure. OK. Um, let's see. Next, we would have, ooh, combat. Ooh. All right, I'm going to give this one to James. Um, we actually had a question that was combined. Uh, how to make it run faster and how do you, the best way to use minis and battle maps with things like this. Um, to me personally, that's kind of counterintuitive, but I'm the hostess. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a panelist today. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, in any role-playing game to have anything run faster, I'd like to have that conversation with my players ahead of time to, you know, be ready for your turn. So one of the easiest ways to make combat faster is to enforce like a no cell phone policy at the table. Or if you're playing online, like don't be on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram when you're playing and be engaged in the game. So you, know, you can still have a very full combat round. And as long as everyone's ready to go, they're not looking their spell up on their turn. They're, you know, ready. They're, they, they're thinking about what's happening because they're watching the halfling go. So it's their wizard's turn. They know what they're going to cast. So especially if you have an experienced group of players, I know the challenge with any system, whether it's DCC or D&D, is at higher level play. Uh, the game can slow down a bit because of character options. But uh, more experienced players, you know, can move the game along quicker but there has to be some trust on the player's part that they're not going to be distracted. So uh, there's nothing wrong with trying to speed things up with uh, simplifying initiative. If you want to do something like that, or if you want to, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think the easiest thing to do really is just make sure the players are totally focused and the combat will go s more smoothly. Now, do you use minis and battle mats in your games? Sometimes. I mean, I, I, occasionally, it, it really depends on, you know, I mean, behind us here, we have a full like Dorvan Forge set up for after, for, for later, for, for Dark Trails, you know? So I think oh, that wow. you can be experienced uh, with miniatures, without miniatures, and it's a, it's a whole different experience either way. Sometimes it's fun to have all those figures on the board and to get that feel. And sometimes it's fun just to, you know, it, it can be kind of challenging to take some of, uh, Doug's maps and convert them into anything else besides the, the glory of his maps, so. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna open up this next one to everybody. Just speak up as you wish. How do you get your warriors and dwarves out of repetitive mighty deed ruts? <laughs> this is an excellent question. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's hard. I've got one player who I'm very fond of who does nothing but take shots at the eyes. Like it's literally, you know, his guy's thing. So I try to gently sort of like, oh yeah, another eye shot. Is this like what they're going to call you? Like, you know, Mike the eye guy, eye stabbing Bob or whatever, you know, like, um, and this is someone who I play with, uh, you know, at least a couple times a year at conventions. 
Um, I just try to be gentle about it, but I also, I feel like if, you know, if you're gonna do it in within one combat, I start um, like if all he does is attack everybody's eyes, I make it less effective and made him make him need a higher number of his D to get the same effect because everyone's starting to watch for it. So I'm, I, I'll actually penalize them for doing the same thing again and again and again. And it's our veteran panelist Brendan LaSalle joining us. For those of us not familiar, uh, X crawl, etc. Um, how about you? Uh, Evie, we haven't heard from you. But how, what's your favorite way to do it? Well, if we're doing the exact same thing over and over again, it gets, you know, really boring to like just watch or just to be there for. So sometimes like if they just keep doing the same thing over and over again, you can like throw something like crazy at them to get them like to scare them off of doing the like thing over and over again. So like if, they, yeah, if they're like attacking someone's eyes again and again, then you could like do something really bad to them and then they're like oh no i can't i shouldn't do that anymore and then it'll like you know drift them away from just being like you can do this again and then then it'll be you know we'll scare them off and they shouldn't do it hopefully we just need more monsters with no eyes that's the <laughs> that was gonna be my solution you throw different monsters at them if you give different monsters with different strengths they'll have to change it up mm -hmm. or die from it <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I also like to do the carrot approach to, to burn and stick where like once they if they finally get out of that rut and try something else, I'll make it more effective kind of like, I'll, you know, maybe I only roll a three on the D die, but I might make it more of what if it were like a four or five, six result, just to kind of give them like, hey, that was awesome. Um, it was more effective because they're so used to you always going after their eyes when you went for the disarm, they weren't expecting it. So, you know, even more. Words got out on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I love it whenever my players try to insert stuff into the physical space of the of the room or the environment. Um, is there a chandelier here? Of course there is, because you asked. And of course you can swing off of it and it's not gonna hurt you if you roll a one on your deed die or you roll a seven. Um, so I think being, um, trying to insert extra things that might not be in the descriptions of rooms, especially if you catch someone getting into a rut, like putting, start to put things for the warriors to jump off of. Um, and, uh, you know, that that will start to help. Um, a change, uh, do some changes in like uh, the height altitude between the characters. Let the warrior have to jump off of something or scurry up something to get into the fight. Um, it's not going to break most of the modules to put a 10 foot cliff in the middle of something uh, yeah. or a balcony into a room or something like that. Um, and I with love custom. Like if you can come up with, if your guy has a signature move that you made up, that's not just, throw dirt in the guy's eyes, I'll let you do that all day if it's your signature move. Like, and I want that signature move to have a situation where it works. I'm stealing all this from Brendan's X crawl rules, but <laughs> it is like, I think that that, when that gets busted out in a, in a regular group, road crew, maybe it's not as exciting because the people don't know each other as often, but in the home game, when the warrior can finally that one time bust out the, the skull cracker or something and he shouts for it and the lightning hits his hammer and he goes for it then i think that could be just as exciting i have two issues with deeds and it's not ever that it's always well it's one of two things it's it's either they don't call a deed they're not used to it so they're just doing like the i hit it right mm -hmm. and trying to get them out of that out of that frame of mind um, and then in the other case where if they're doing the same thing over and over again it's usually because the first time that you did it they did it, you made it too effective, mm -hmm. right? So like, if you have someone that knows how to game the game and you pretty much made that last deed die, the last time they, they hit it, the fight ended, of course they're gonna keep doing it over and over and over again. Um, so I think it people don't realize and they forget sometimes that, yeah, the deed goes off on a three, but that doesn't mean it's gonna do exactly the most effective result of what you were going for, right? Like there, there's definitely a range of that three to 10 when you start getting higher deed dice. So yeah, maybe you blind the guy. Maybe you you know you went for his eyes and it dropped his it dropped his action die down for the next round by like one, 
right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, think think of other ways and and wait, you know what. The D's not always going to do exactly what the player wants, but it's always good to tell them that beforehand too. Like if you roll a three, here's what's going to happen. And if you roll a four or five, here's what will happen. There'll be more. So Yeah, I get a lot of the, uh, uh, well, what's you going to do the deeds? What's your deed? I'm going to decapitate him. Um, you're a first <laughs> yeah. level warrior. Um, and yeah, you're not. Um, you can aim for the head and maybe it's going to cause him to drop back and not swing on your... Uh, on you the next round because he's cowering because you went for his head but mm -hmm. i you're not decapitating him as a first level character unless it's a one hit die or less than one hit die monster if the thing's got two hit points sure you can decapitate him because if you hit you're doing at least two but hopefully if you're a warrior excellent points guys um one of the other really sticky wickets that we run into is the game ending or the game nerfing spell. You get the game breakers like Charm Person or Lotus Stare that just completely take out your big bad. How do you deal with that? Most of the time I just let him do it. Um, it's... Uh... It's just part and parcel of uh, convention and one shots. Um, I, I ran Grave Matters this weekend. I don't know if any of my players are in here, um, but uh, they got through, got the MacGuffin out without ever rolling initiative because of clever use of charm person um, <laughs> and um, some sort of like sneaking, a lot of sneaking around and really hot dice in roll 20. Um, so uh yeah they it, it's it's if you haven't looked at grave matters it's a it, it is like a heist you're just supposed to break into a place and steal a thing and they did it without ever actually getting into a real combat um and there was spell burn and there was uh luck burn um to kind of hit the right numbers but i i i think they had fun i thought it was hilarious um i loved it because it was a role-playing game it wasn't a combat game um and they were asked to do it without doing too much damage and they did so uh yeah that's right they are <laughs> yeah there's also i mean we um, had we did it last night mark plord did a, almost 100 points of damage on the last monster with a magic missile with a third level character a second level character it was two in the morning we were ready to be done so <laughs> What about you, Evie? How do you how do you normally react to something like that? Um, so well, okay. So I ran Mall Mall like two days ago. I think it was two days ago, and I had this giant scene that I came up with like on the fly in my head because it made the most sense. And I had like three giant people for them to defeat, and the one person just like, can we just kill the one person and like run away and then like toy light the entire place on fire? I'm like yeah sure but like in my mind I'm like I had this giant like idea in my head and they just burnt the entire place down instead so um I mean yeah I let them do it but like I'm just kind of like oh no I can't kill as many people now because they just ran away <laughs> you know I I felt bad because uh I did this to Mark's game about two hours ago in his session of the squeak shell inherit the earth and uh, nuke the last scenes. I never get to do that to people. I never play. I got to play this Cyclops Con. But something that Evie and I did last year at Gen Con for our X Crawl, our Philadelphia based X Crawl game, is we introduced a false big boss before the real big boss. And so the party had to attack a spell casting Nick Foles quarterback from the Eagles. And they defeated him. And that's when Gritty showed up. And uh, Gritty was way more dangerous. I think we TPK'd yeah, one we of them, one of the parties, because they just went crazy on the first boss. And then from his ashes, like a second boss appeared. So, you know, kind of flip things on the, the heads of the players who were used to that, that finale scene. I think Haley. anyone that's ever run a game for Haley has had to deal with this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I say, Haley, how do you deal with the, the shoe on the other foot? Personally, I love it when watching the wizard or the cleric burn everything that they have, everyone gets so into it and they want them to succeed. My favorite thing personally is when they then immediately roll a one and everything still goes sideways. 
has happened many times. But I think in con games, that's just part of the beast is watching them burn it all down. And I think it's your responsibility as the DM to make that interesting and fun for the party. How you describe it, how you throw it at them. That's what makes it fun. I just had a game where our uh, our wizard cast animal summoning and ended up with 200 chickens that attacks the final boss and like it went insane but that's what people are going to remember that's the moment that people are always going to remember from that game so i say let them go for it it's it's their character yeah, everything that comes around goes around or whatever the saying is like that wizard's going to have that time to win right but it's definitely going to come back to bite them essentially one day like they're going to roll a one on a spell check and then the misfire is going to definitely ruin their day so the way, I mean, I'm not adversarial. Like, I, I'm not there to have my bad guys win. So I let them have, like, let them have their wins. Um, and it's always, like, a storytelling moment. It, it's different when it's a con game because you have to, like, fill that four-hour slot. And if they if they nuke the bad guy way too fast, and you have to kind of, like, scramble to come up with stuff. But in a campaign, even if it throws you way off, there's nothing, there's no shame in saying, hey, all right, let's, let's pause. Maybe you need to take 10 minutes or if you have to kind of, like, end the session early to kind of come up with what happens next. That's, that's, just do that, right? Instead of instead of saying no, that doesn't happen, or somehow trying to undo what they did. Um, definitely let them let them have their win, and then, like I said, uh, regroup, think of how it affects the world, and come back again. Now, to turn that on its head, what do you do when they end up with massive spell checks on things like Magic Shield? They've got these plus seven immunities. They've got huge bonuses to everything and they start out a session that way and they've got it for days. How do you handle that? I mean, to be fair, with a plus seven AC, you're still a wizard. <laughs> you're still very <laughs> hittable. <laughs> um, I mean, I not think, at level one. I, if you've got, the, yeah, if you've got something think, geared for level one. <laughs> yeah, I think again, you just, you have to figure out ways around it, not to kind of like, ruin it for them they were smart enough to do that in the beginning but also if they burn everything on their first spell check to get magic shield they now are weak they have no stamina they have no like they're going to be vulnerable if they do that and i think you just have to kind of take advantage of that injecting a little intelligence into your monsters uh and some tactics isn't a bad idea when something like that happens you know, too often, uh, you know, if, if you're running an adventure, you have your monster attack, you fight till they're all dead, you move to the next encounter. There's nothing wrong with the monsters fleeing or regrouping, especially if you're playing, you're running orcs or, or goblins or something like that. Let them be tricky and do things to weaken the party. Uh, maybe they, they attack for a bit, the spellcasters cast their spells, they realize they're getting decimated and they they retreat to another area, set some traps behind them, and, and if there's pursuit, uh, you know, it, again, you're not trying to kill off the players, uh, maybe, maybe you might be, <laughs> but, you know, you give the, you, you, you give the, 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 the monsters some ability to, to rethink their tactics uh, and try something from a different direction. Um, I got uh, one thing um, I want to add to that is that uh, when, when, okay, when, the wizard does burn everything down, make sure you keep up with their modifiers because a lot of folks will sort of role play it, but not like figure out, hey, now that my stat, like, you know, legitimately a lot of wizards, especially if they've already been in a little bit of combat, if they burn their stamina down with three, they should die, die. right? Yeah. You know, like their hit points should go underwater just from the attempt, which is, I think that's a great ending scene for a thing, you know, the wizard blows it all out you know, whatever it is goes away. You get your 200 chickens and then he falls over dead. Ugh, that's fantastic. You know what I mean? Especially for a con game, give me that all day. But just make sure that you, that they're playing that part of it out correctly. And like suddenly, hey, your armor class is now seven. You can't lift your backpack. You can't pick up your spell book. And your hit points are, you know, you're, you know, hilariously, like they only have a four-sided hit die. And now they're minus three on every hit die. Have you, have you, have you been hit at all today? At all? You know? So just to keep, keep that in mind, I think too, you know, there, there are just abstractions like that as far as that they actually will screw up your guys in other ways. So. Uh, like Jeff Goad, yeah. Like Jeff Goad. <laughs> <laughs> he burned everything down to straight threes and then had somebody else put him in, literally in, in a little backpack so he could be, you know, the, <laughs> the, 
the backpack wizard. Uh, yeah, it was bad. Uh, okay, we do have a new question popping in here that I will pay attention to. It's a good question. Are there any DCC core rules that you constantly ignore or alter? I think my only house rule is when clerics, if they get a really high result on their lay on hands and it's more than the characters hit die that they're healing, I will let them essentially do the advantage mechanic. So if you heal three hit dice, but the guy only has one, I'll let you roll all three and take the highest. Um, instead, of, instead of letting that high spell check go to waste. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that's that's nice. At my table, we call that the Deshane rule. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah. And I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, with permission, we have actually codified that for X crawl. So that's yeah. actually going to be on the books, uh, you know, for the, uh, the new version. So nice. Yeah. We, uh, I, I don't know when Tim and I talked about that, but um, I also do that same thing. Um, and I, I, I think we actually came up with it independently and we're hanging out at Gen Con one day and we're like, Oh, okay, cool. Sweet. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah, I, I use as much of it as I can. Um, there's a lot of stuff for one shot um, games that I don't pay that much attention to because I often have players that aren't experts with the rules. So I saw an example, uh, one of the responses was Mercurial Magic. Like, I love it. I'll put it in if I make the spell book um, beforehand. A lot of times I don't want to burn that much paper um, to show up with full spell books for multiple characters and stuff. So um, I tend to skip that for time purposes. Um, manifestations, same way. If I've got a player who knows how to play a wizard and wants to roll their own manifestations and describe their spells, perfect. Um, the, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, otherwise I, I try to roll with it. I've, I've even got some like kind of house rules. If you got a character for a one shot that has a familiar or a patron or something like that, that you would have to cast in advance, there's built in, um, uh, I was like, you, you probably spell burned like three years ago, whenever this, you know, you learned animal or, you know, the fine familiar. So um, give yourself a plus five and make a spell check. And then we'll go from there and just make it right at the, right at the beginning of the session um the uh because they would have healed that back by that point unless it's a level one character then it's then this right is the first adventure so um there's one thing that i do that this isn't just something that i clarify for my own games rather than um really like, I, I don't know if you know it's, it's kind of vague in the book it's intentionally vague in the books but it is uh, thieves and halflings who earn luck as part of a reward um, if a thief or a halfling in my game earns luck as a part of reward, I add that to their total, no matter how low they've burnt their luck down to. I, I think it's only fair. And I think that it's one of the only ways that halflings actually scale up at higher levels is if that every time they get a, a, an actual luck reward, their luck goes up and up and up. You know, the, you know, a 10th level warrior is the toughest guy in the, in the land and a 10th level halfling should be the luckiest fool, you know, in the universe, you know? What about you, Haley? I know that uh, when you run the tournaments yourself, um, is there anything that you change to your liking or do you take it all rules as written? I mean, I think every rule at some point has been broken or bent. Um, people are always gonna try and change whatever they can. And I, I encourage that unless it's blatant and overpowering. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, I don't really go straight based on the rules rule book I just kind of play and what happens happens so I'm trying to think of like specific rules that I break and I can't come up with one <laughs> I stopped giving uh I, I I the more we've played DCC Lankmar uh the more I've, I've kind of like tacked in a more heroic direction with our DCC and I stopped giving uh stamina or stat loss for characters that go to zero hit points you know to have those characters be more heroic and not you know become uh that unplayable character we had this really great warrior in an ongoing dcc campaign i had a few years ago where we went right from through the purple planet but he had like a four stamina because he had started out as the tank but kept getting dropped to, to zero hit points you know so in our with with our our Lankmar game uh, that we're doing right now, I 
sort of an away from taking that that stat drain unless it really makes sense. So that's one I've sort of started to ignore. It's almost um, better to die um, sometimes and get the one in three chance of not losing the hit points, like losing the strength and yeah. I mean, it's a 50-50 chance you ain't coming back, you know, but. Uh. Well, and, and in Lankmar, um, you don't get that one in three. If, if you're knocked unconscious and then brought back, uh, you take stamina loss. Mm -hmm. It's if your body is rolled that you actually right. get the one in three chance of which. Which is always, it yeah. almost. That roulette. <laughs> it almost leans always towards the stamina side, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so I, I, that's, you know, between, between that and I let our Lankmar characters get two sets of 3D6 in order, not just one, they get to pick the, their favorite of the two. We, we did those two things to make it a little bit more of a customizable experience. I just got a, another little idea. Spell duels are often tossed to the wind, I think, because everyone loves to have a big, big bad wizard at the end, but when it comes to having your wizard fight their wizard, it's just too much to try and do a spell duel. understandable uh, and of course as the rules say it's your game make it what you will uh, speaking of lankmar though with mcc lankmar dying earth uh, all of the different settings that are out there uh, what kind of things do you do to set them apart when you if you do run these different settings I, with the exception of Lankmar, with DCC and MCC, I just mash them together. Like, I don't, uh, so I have essentially taken- Opposite it, of the question, James. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But I, I feel like DCC works really well with artifacts and mutations. So artifacts and mutations, essentially, I poured it over into DCC. So often in my DCC games, there is a mutant class and a manimal class because I think they fit alongside the rest of the classes very well. So I've taken that into DCC. I also made mutations a reward. So I know in the game we play with Evie and her friends, they are DCC character classes, but each of them have at least one mutation they've earned. That's a little bit metamorphosis alpha there. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, so one of my home campaigns is the that I'm not running, another person's running is the campaign that caused Starcrawl to be produced. And Starcrawl was intended to be a bounce around every possible genre to game in. Um, that's not the point of Starcrawl. <laughs> the point of the campaign was that. Starcrawl got written, so we had space rules. And then the GM, Jonathan, really liked them. So he tried to codify them. And so now we have a party of wizards and dwarves that have a spaceship and fly around space and do things like that. Um, so I think the mash up is is totally fine. There there is some stuff like I you know if I'm running Lankmar at a convention or if I run it at home, I'm going to do the literary version because that's what distinguishes it. Um, I don't tend to use fleeting luck. I know everybody loves it. I don't use fleeting luck unless it's Lankmar. Um, I don't use Mojo unless it's X Crawl. Um, because I think it's something, I, I love the mechanics, but I think it's something that makes that game extra special and a little bit different than what I ran last month. Um, I don't think that's the right or wrong way to do it. Uh, that's just some things. I, I do try to, I'm not a rule stickler, but I try to like, when you signed up for my game, you are getting Dungeon Crawl Classics. You're not getting <laughs> Mike Crawl Classics. I love Doug Crawl Classics. You know, I, I love, Con, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, it's, you can, you can argue that that is its own experience. And what I'm trying to provide is not like dissimilar from what I'm playing with Tim or playing with uh, Brendan or Jim. It's, you know, I want to provide that same sort of experience for, for others. So. Got a question here for uh, I think Tim and Haley. I'm I'm really curious. Uh, what is the most serious or non-Gonzo DCC campaign or adventure you've been a part of? Haley, you go first. Serious? Uh, <laughs> running or playing? 
Um, either either way, I mean, do, do you feel DCC can translate itself well for a less gonzo, more epic type adventure? Um, I I always think it depends on the players at the table, honestly. If you walk in with a party that wants to go insane, they're going to do that. Um, I think the most serious thing I've been a part of was the tournament at Gen Con. Uh, any tournament, I've noticed people step it up and they're more serious and they want um, they want to win. So they, they are less crazy and more get to the point, get to the end. Um, so I think as a DM, those are the like most serious games I've run. Yeah, I'm going to say, so it's funny that you, either you or the questionnaire picked me up because I've had this discussion a bunch of times, both on G plus and the Facebook group of how much I hate when DCC is described as gonzo as like a default. Um, because when I run games, none of my games, at least from my point of view, have ever been gonzo, um, unless I'm doing a very specifically off the wall thing for a one shot at like a, at a, at a charity night or at a, at a con. Um, I think I really try and lean hard into the appendix and I try and run like my DCC campaign is like if Poole Anderson and Robert Howard had a baby and that's, that's, that's my DCC uh, world, right? Um, so that's like, I think my home campaign is the least gonzo and it, yes, it lends itself to campaign play because we're on a pause now, but we, when we first started playing DCC, we went multiple years of the same characters from zero level up to where they got to be about six level. Um, but then my most gonzo was at one of my charity nights at the brewery. I was like, hey, we're gonna do like a Saturday morning cartoon game, pick a Saturday morning cartoon character. Oh, you wanna be He-Man? Cool, you wanna be Jabberjaw? And like we were able to with both like MCC and DCC just make this ridiculous game where one of my friends was playing Skeletor and he was an amazing Skeletor and it was just this crazy, you know, bunch of dudes that grew up in the 80s getting to live their fantasies of being their favorite cartoon character you know um but i think in this is it's kind of advice i got from doug kovacs for the first time uh was when he said the judge has to be the straight man because the players are going to try and take the game as crazy and off the rails as they you know that they're going to be the ones to do it so if you want the game to be serious it's the judge's job to kind of play neutral and play it straight and not 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 leaning into it if that's the, if the direction you don't want to go with the tone so what about you evie have you played in a, or taken part in a serious dcc game um yes i, I mean it's not what you're known for but you no know, okay so well running wise i mean they're usually kind of crazy but like the other night i only killed like two people like that's <laughs> literally that's like next to nothing to what like I'm compared to, you know, in the past. Uh, um, but like taking part, like I don't really run serious games um, because I'm not, uh, I don't know. I like running more like, they're not like gonzo gonzo, but they're not like, just like super. They about puppets. Okay, that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> Um, but like, if I'm playing in a serious game, like the one, the Lankmar game that we're playing, like right now, um, well, yeah, it's like more serious, and I was told it has to be serious, so I'm, <laughs> I'm running, it, like not running it, but like I'm playing in it like seriously. But yeah, running wise, I mean, it just depends on the day. Uh, oh, your games are crazy. That's not true. The game I ran the other night was not that crazy. <laughs> Okay, so we have so many great flavors of DCC now with, I mean, DCC, MCC, Dark Trails, Lankmar. We've got uh, Dying Earth coming out. We've got uh, Changeling Earth, a little bit of that coming out. And all of these third party products. What is the untapped genre just waiting for a DCC version? Not everyone at once now. I mean, with the zine community, I feel like so much of it's like been covered because we've got, you know, cyberpunk stuff and we've got um, like crime noir stuff. I mean, it, like things that I would never, you know, immediately jump to. Um, there's <laughs> we have like 
multiple versions of doing DCC in space. Um, Westerns, we got, right? We got um, yeah. Pirates. <laughs> um, now, if we're thinking about like official Goodman games, you know, then that's that's different than, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's such a robust zine community. If there's a, a setting, it's there. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with Bronx Beasts. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Is there like a Gundam one, like Robotech? <laughs> Does, has anybody done that yet? Or you're well, there's, no, there's no mecha yet. So. Yeah. Well, um, Dito's running Dragon Mech. All right. Uh, yeah. But that's I mean, its own kind of thing, you know? Yeah. But and, and Dinosaur Crawl Classics. We can't forget that. <laughs> yeah. And Star Crawl is going to have some mech stuff soon. So I forgot about it, but um, we actually started playtesting it like a year ago. Um, and then uh, a bunch of stuff went on hi hiatus. So And Star um, Crawl, not to be confused with Crawl Jammer. Right. Or uh, Black Sun Death Crawl. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so nothing, nothing strikes you. Well, I mean, no, yeah, now that got now one that, of us. Now that Bob's pirate thing has showed up, I think we're covered. Super <laughs> crossbone classics. Yep. I, that, that was the missing link, and now we've got it. I have my got my copy the other day, so I'm ready. Yeah. There's a chatter mentions superhero. Um, I don't know that. I don't think I've seen that. I mean, obviously not, you can just not official. Take, yeah. yeah, you could take I, MCC. Yeah, and, we, we've hacked MCC for that. Yeah. yeah, I can say Same. that there are people right now working Ooh. on a DCC superhero um, setting slash new rules thing with new character classes. And from what I've seen, it's pretty hip. So far. Is there, you know what there, with there, with, I, I haven't seen, it may exist because I, again, I'm not up to every single zine, but, you know, the, uh, uh, <laughs> like to some way to, to do the college experience with DCC. Is there a DCC <laughs> like university? Thing out there like like hogwarts is there anything like that out there i haven't seen yet you're in it right now jim oh, <laughs> yeah. i'm Roll talking for initiative. about a setting you know like like dcc meets like community or something for yeah. judges by judges yes i'll tell you guys what i'll write that as i go through college and i'll uh i'll start taking notes i'll write there you go <laughs> well, so gotta... me. i don't remember what it was like so you know and <laughs> Animal House Crawl Classics. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple suggestions in the sidebar here, like pulp adventures, like Indiana Jones type stuff. Um, I about died at Corporate Culture DCC, Paycheck Pathos. <laughs> mm. uh, someone else says, yeah, Gundam Crawl Classics does seem to be needed. Uh, how... There's a good incoming one. How do you balance prep work for a session without coming across as railroading the game? Uh, that's that's an interesting one. That yeah, took me uh, a long, long time to figure out. Go ahead, go ahead. I just I remember I started running. Obviously, I was fourteen, so I was over prepared. I was insane. Everything had to be perfect. I had props. I had insane amounts of stuff going on. And now it's kind of gotten to the point where I read the adventure once or twice. I make myself note cards beforehand for the monster so that it's quick and easy. But other than that, I just kind of, you read through it enough where you know it, but don't stress yourself out because then you lose fun as the DM. You're like, you're not having fun anymore either. So I think it's, you just have to trust yourself and your players aren't going to hate you if you mess up once or twice and they aren't going to know. They're not going to go read the module. <laughs> <laughs> they can't read. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh, some of them can be. I mean, obviously not C L A Y. I mean, I, I, oh, I'm like, um, I tell my players if I screw something up from the module because that I want to let them know it really can be better. Than <laughs> you know, um, I think do all the prep you want to do to feel to feel ready, but then be prepared to throw away your babies. You know, if if you do all this prep about the east side of the town and everyone wants to go to the west side of town. Smart, grin and bear it and just go there and then that's when you use your improv skills but those those you know that kind of prep the, the prep that you have done will inform the uh, improvisational stuff that you had to create so don't feel like it's wasted yeah I, I leave it to the players also to help out in the sense of like if you've ever read any of the west marches 
how to's. Um, I would say my lack of railroading, like right now with my Swords and Wizardry campaign is like before we meet on Wednesday, you the players have to tell me where you want to go to explore. And then I will prep that location. Um, yeah, without input from the players beforehand, I feel like there's almost no way to not railroad them um, without just then the, my, the other thing I hate, but probably more than railroading is just making it all up as you go along because then it means like the player's choices don't matter. Um, so I need input beforehand in order to kind of prep what they're gonna be doing that session, um, you know, have everything in place for when they get there to explore their decisions. That's matter. particularly speaking of a campaign, right? Yeah, yeah, and then, I mean, if you, show, if you sign up for a con game, I don't care about railroading. You're there for four hours. You're here to play that adventure. <laughs> it's going to be a railroad. Like, get on board. Um, yeah. Or you can go You can go back to the tavern. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the $4 that went to Gen Con. Um, <laughs> I didn't get it. You lost it. Um, sorry about you. I don't know. Like. I need lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that kind of, that, that's a really nice segue there, Mike. Uh, how do you fit or build an adventure into a limited time slot? Yeah, um, <laughs> a lot of experience running one shots. Um, this doesn't matter for the campaign, right? Like you can stop it at any time and then bring it back from where it was. Um, uh, you know, Goodman publishes modules that are of specific length. So if you're using their modules and you feel like it's a 32 pager, you're probably not doing it in one session. Um, if it's one of those cool, uh, like, uh, the best ones are the ones that are for, for like, if you're trying to keep it tight is free RPG day, the convention specific release modules. Um, those are all the, the stuff that's in the back. You bought this for the module that was on the cover, but Terry or Steven Newton or somebody else has a little six pager that fills out the back half of it. Um, those are perfect for taking to your, you know, online game. When we get to go back to the stores, um, you know, we can, we can do that again there. But for now, that's, that's good for the online session. I think there's also, um, know what the, the the most important part of that adventure is like there's often a lot of extra stuff to kind of build it up if you just got to give a data dump and you're starting on page eight of the 16 page module like it doesn't matter it could have been backstory anyway like everything that you're playing up to whatever point you start at could have been backstory so don't get too attached pick your favorite parts out and highlight those and and wave the rest. I think no, it's. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, depending on the module, and if you uh, are looking at watching your time is important when you're running a module, but think of ways you could end the module early in case it happens. For instance, I've run Sailors in a Starless Sea probably a dozen times. A well, great thing about that module is you can literally carve out pieces of the middle and end it different segments there's no reason why you can't go down the stairs and you're right at the ziggurat if you want to take parts out if your party spent a lot of time exploring the outside of the keep they come inside they explore everything and then you're in the last hour uh, of your game do you want to have them going through the 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 inner workings of the fortress or do you want to wrap it up sooner any adventure module you could look at pulling things forward and really great advice, guys. Um, I'm looking at the clock and it looks mm. like we're about ready for our switch over to the AMA with our very own Brendan LaSalle. So I'd like to take this moment to thank our panelists for being with us on the DCC College. And to everybody watching, listening, uh, catching up afterwards, feel free to drop us an email. Uh, I myself am you know, Jen at goodman-games.com and I would love to fill your questions into the next college that we hold. I think so, the next thing we should do should be 
Hollywood Squares DCC edition of looking at this layout. I think it'd be <laughs> The downside is it shows up differently. Let me rephrase that. The upside is it shows up differently for everybody. So. Yeah. I'll <laughs> so only do it good. if I can be Paul Lind. <laughs> oh! <laughs> That's for Brendan. Uh, <laughs> There's four people who know who Paul Lind is on this call, so. Yeah. So I, I <laughs> because think that, we're old. <laughs> I, I think that'll do it for us. Um, and to those who submitted questions ahead of time, we thank you. And to our panelists, uh, from from the people submitting questions, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, for all the, of us players and judges, and for giving your time to the con. <laughs>